Snakes kind of suck to study in the fossil record, because when you think about fossils, you need a few things to actually become a fossil. The first one is to be buried in rock, which sure happens with snakes. The second is to be robust enough that those bones don't just get totally obliterated by geologic forces. Which means, in general, the most common kinds of fossils we have are things like limb bones, which snakes don't have, or potentially even jaw bones, which snakes have, but they kind of blew up their skull, for lack of a better term. Because of the limitations in how snakes feed, they evolved instead of having dense, hard skulls, skulls that are fragile and can go and expand way, way wider than the rest of the skull normally is. But that also means those bones are a lot flimsier than most other bones from skulls, so they don't fossilize that often either. Honestly, the most common snake fossils are just a handful of vertebra, and normally these aren't very good for trying to understand what animal they came from, and that's because a lot of snake vertebra look really, really similar. So it's really hard to try and identify certain snake groups down to anything other than, oh, it's some sort of colubrid, or some sort of viper, or some sort of boid. It's really, really rough to try and study them in the fossil record. This is where the fossils from the Hickory Tree Cave Deposit actually come in a lot of handy, because these fossils are recent enough that they would have been left by snakes that still have living representatives. So it's just a rattlesnake, but from a few tens of thousands of years ago, and we can hopefully identify what species of rattlesnake. And that's what one master student at Eastern Tennessee State University went to do. They looked at these fossils to go, hey, can we figure out something more than these are some sort of viper vertebra? They looked at the six main vertebra that were found in this cave, but then they also looked at four modern species of viper. First is Cordylus hordis, or the timber rattlesnake, which lives there today, as well as Cordylus adamantius, the eastern diamondback, which actually lives much further south today. Agacastrodon piscivorus, or the cottonmouth, also doesn't live there today, but Agacastrodon contorix does live there today that one being the copperhead. Vertebra from snakes collected more closely to recent day were photographed, and different points on the vertebra were all mapped out. They then repeated this with the fossil vertebra and were able to run them through a matrix to try and understand what kind of species that these fossils from Tennessee would have been from. And they found a few interesting things, actually. Using these graphs, the shapes are indicative of the genus, so Crotalus or Agkistrodon, and then the color indicates what part of the body it came from. Is it from the front third, the middle third, or the final third of the body? And this can be done for many features across the entire body. And actually, you can see in one of the graphs that kind of summarizes the data here. And there is definitely some overlap, but certain traits are entirely outside of the vertebra shape of the other genera. This is especially true of the mid-body vertebra, and when they actually applied those 2D maps from the different points that were mapped out on the vertebra, you can really see where those fossils plot out. And of the six that were added, four of them were kind of what was expected. They were Crotalus horridus, or the timber rattlesnake, probably the most common viper on the eastern half of the United States today. However, two of the other ones were more unexpected, because neither of them aligned with the copperhead. Instead, one was aligned with the eastern diamondback rattlesnake, and another one was aligned with the cottonmouth. Two species which do not live in Tennessee today, or at least not this portion of Tennessee. So it's a bit unexpected to find these fossils this far north, especially as during this time period, it was the ice ages that would have been even colder this far north. But whatever happened to the environment helped these species to get that far north. And in the case of the cottonmouth, maybe it's just more streams and runoff from those glaciers, providing more water habitat. And maybe the same thing for the eastern diamondback too, as it does live in the southwest where there are a lot of swamps and other bodies of water. That potentially is what led them to be successful there. Now there is still some question about the cottonmouth occurrence, because in most of the graphs it does pretty much fall on the kind of boundary between Crotalus horridus and the cottonmouth. So, Potentially, it could just be a very strange timber rattlesnake. However, when you're looking at the eastern diamondback occurrence, when you look at some of these different graphs, it pretty clearly lines up far outside of what we would expect for the timber rattlesnake. So it's pretty much not a timber rattlesnake, but it doesn't belong to either of the other species. It must be an eastern diamondback, at least according to this study. And this makes sense when we think about the evolutionary history of some of these animals. It's not like they had just split up from one another. For the case of the timber rattlesnake and the eastern diamondback, it seems like they split from one another about 10 million years ago. And for Achistrodon and Crotalus, the genera, 
seems like they split about 14 million years ago. So there's a good amount of time up until these rocks were deposited, which again, at best, a few tens of thousand years ago, but they could potentially be as young as just 2.6 thousand years ago, well within the times humans would have actually been on the continent. It really is frustrating we don't have better dating for them, but cave deposits can be very hard to try and get a good age of. But the main takeaways here are, hey, we actually can use vertebra to distinguish species of snakes. We don't just have to go, it's some sort of vaguely viper thing, or potentially even some sort of vaguely colubrid thing. We have the measurements to be able to say more distinctly what they would have been. And that's really helpful, because again, snakes kind of suck to study in the fossil record. And maybe it'll be a little harder to do that further back in the fossil record, but we're at least getting a decent start towards what these snakes may have been and how they may have evolved and changed their geographic ranges.